Please bow and pray with me. Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit now. Help me fade to the background that you, Lord Jesus, would be high and lifted up, that you would draw all people to yourself, that fruit would be harvested, to, harvested by you, God the Father. Lord, move as only you can and bring about the fruit that you desire. We ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Turn with me to John 15. In your <clears throat> pew Bible is preferable or the Bibles you brought with you as I will be branching out in various ways, pun intended. I'll pick up in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I think it's fair to say that when we look out in the world or we watch the news, we can say that there might be some things off in the world. So how do we bring about positive change? For ourselves personally, how do we obey? How do we break bad habits? How do we help others out? How can we help the chaos? The song we just sang, go to a world that is dying. Is it our own strength and ingenuity? How about the right person with the right ideas? Will they be able to help us out? What if we just exert enough effort Will that be the answer to bring about this change that we all long for and we desire in our own lives? In his book, The Cross and the Switchblade, David Wilkerson recounts the story of trying to reach the inner city youth of New York City for Jesus Christ. Teenagers who were filled with loneliness, lust, and anger and who were strung out on drugs. Well, he partnered with some 60 different churches from around the city. They pooled their resources. They rented a huge arena. They got buses, and they went and picked up the various gangs because they couldn't cross rival gang turf without wars breaking out. And so they went and picked up all these gang members. They brought them to the arena so that they could hear David preach. In other words, a lot of time, energy, and money went to win this populace, these youth gang members for Jesus Christ. Only one issue. It didn't work. Night after night, nothing changed. Either few people showed up, and those that did show up, there wasn't much to be seen in terms of positive change. That is, until the night that David stopped midway through sermon, and he turned it over to Christ. Listen to what he recounts about that night. He says, I couldn't understand what was wrong with my sermon. I felt like this sometimes. <laughs> I'd done everything I could to make it a good one. I'd spent hours preparing it, prayed over every line of it. I'd even fasted in the hope that this would strengthen my delivery and my persuasiveness. But I might as well have stood up and read the stock market report, for nothing came through. <laughs> to make matters worse, one of the youth stood up, and they said, how can we love others? That's what he was preaching about. When they want to stab us, this is humanly impossible. To which David responded, it isn't anything we can achieve through our own efforts. We simply have to ask God to give us his kind of love. We cannot work it up by ourselves. No sooner had the words come out of his mouth that he realized that God was speaking those words to him. You see, he had put a lot of effort into even being able to speak to this group, even into a sermon, but nothing was coming. And he realized those words were for him. He had to get out of the way. And so right then and there, he stopped in the middle of this arena with all of these gang members, and he prayed for several minutes. And they watched, and this is part of what he prayed. He said, all right, Jesus, there is nothing more that I can do. I invited these young people here. Now I'm going to step out of the picture. Come, Holy Spirit. If you want to reach the hearts of any of these boys and girls, it will have to be through your presence. Have your own way, Lord. Have your own way. That's when he started to hear it. 
It came first from the gang known as the Mau Mau's, if you've read the story. And it was tears. People started to cry. And then tears erupt throughout the whole arena. It's, it gives me chills to think about because if any of you are aware of the Great Awakening, this happened with Jonathan Edwards. And it was funny, too, because Jonathan Edwards, he didn't preach extemporaneously. He would read his manuscript. <laughs> and on several occasions, he would look out and his congregation would be in tears. And this is what he found. He, he heard people crying. And that night, countless gang members turned away from their life of crime and they turned to Christ. And it was amazing because the, New, the NYPD, the New York Police Department, reached out to David. And they said, what did you do? They said, we've been trying for months to be able to uh, stop the crime that they've been committing. We've been battling them for years. And this morning, they march in, and he's referring to the Mau Mau group, the Mau Mau gang. They march in, and they turn over their weapons to the NYPD. And, and the, the sergeant in charge said, they've asked me to autograph their Bibles. This is a true story. And they've been fighting it, right? What will bring about the positive change that we need? He was preaching, and they weren't hearing his word. And so what did he do? He stepped out of the way, and he said, Jesus, you've got to do this. How many of you are struggling with something right now? Maybe you don't want to love God. Maybe you don't want to obey, right? Maybe it's some bad habit that you just cannot shake. Maybe you're tired of looking at the world and the chaos, and you're thinking, man, this just isn't working, right? I just can't get the right politician in office. They just cannot do the job. What can bring about the change? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's what we just sang. And this is what John tells us. He says, change is possible, but it's only in one place, and that's if we turn to Christ. And like David Wilkerson, step, out of the side, or step to the side and say, Jesus, I can't do this. You must. And as we turn to Jesus in John 15, we see him pointing us to three things. The vine, the vine dresser, and the branches. So let's look at these. First, the vine. Either during the Last Supper or shortly thereafter, Jesus proclaimed in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. But you have to ask the question, what in the world is he saying, I am the vine? I mean, this seems a bit unusual. You know, for our context, I mean, okay, that's fantastic. You're, are you a fruit? I mean, but imagine if he went to Russia, and Jesus showed up, and he said, I am the sickle and the hammer. Do you think Russians would have any idea what he would be saying? Especially those that grew up in the communist era. The sickle and the hammer. Oh, man, this is going to get interesting. What if Jesus showed up to America and he said, I am the red, white, and blue? Would we Americans have any idea what he was saying? Absolutely we would. Somehow he would be connecting with us as a people, as a nation. But don't you see it was the same thing with the Jews. He shows up and he says, I am the vine. But did you know throughout the Old Testament... The vine symbolized a people. Do you know what people? Israel. It represented Israel. Psalm 80 talks about God bringing the vine out of Egypt and planting it in the promised land. Isaiah 5 refers to Israel as a vineyard that produced wild grapes. Wild is also translated as stinking and sour. Stinking is my favorite, though. Anytime you come across a Hebrew lexicon and it's referring to people and the translation is stinking, you can understand they're trying to communicate something. Well, this revelation was shocking since God had made every provision for his vineyard Israel to bear good fruit and to become a blessing to the whole world. In the youth group today, we were talking about this. God promised Abraham that he would bless every nation on earth. It would be a blessing. And yet Israel... The vine, the vineyard, was producing wild grapes, stinking grapes. Has anyone ever bitten to a stinking grape, by the way? My boys love grapes for lunch, and so I'm given the task of washing said grapes. But every now and again, I need to test one. And if you've ever bitten into one that's, you know, it's not good, you'll know what I'm talking about. And that's what God was talking about with his people. It was stinking grapes. In a similar vein, Jeremiah, the prophet, in Jeremiah 2.21 says, I planted you a choice vine. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? But alas, Israel had failed, and thus they came under God's judgment. 
Now, this is very similar to the parable of the fig tree. You remember the parable of the fig tree that Jesus said coming out of the temple? He saw the fig tree. And did it produce fruit? It didn't have any fruit. And so remember what he did? He cursed it, and it's shriveled up. Can you imagine being one of the disciples? Oh, that's, what in the world? It was symbolizing his people as a whole. He came to his own, and they did not receive him. They had produced stinking grapes, and he cursed them. It came under the judgment. But before we throw Israel under the bus, let us remember that we all do the same thing. All of us have failed through our own strength, energy, and time to live lives that glorify God and lives that bless others. Our own strength and wisdom is not enough, and quite honestly, it is the very thing that is hindering us. It is the thing that is causing our problems. If any positive change is going to come about, God is going to have to intervene. He's going to have to show up. And if we go back to Psalm 80, where it talks about God taking this vine and it producing this wild Uh, these wild grapes, look at how it continues. The psalmist says in verses 17 through 19 of Psalm 80, but let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine on us that we may be saved. Here Jesus proclaims to be that true vine. He is proclaiming that he is the true Israel, the one that will bear fruit and bring salvation. He is the one who can and will bear good fruit, and all those who turn to him will as well, because they will become part of God's people. That is the true Israel. The picture of the vine isn't just a clever illustration from gardening. No, it explains who Jesus is, who his people are, and what will happen to all those who connect to God through Christ. And that leads us to our second point, the vine dresser. We know who the vine is. Well, who is the vine dresser, and what does he do? Well, verse 1 tells us that he is God the Father. But verse 2 goes on to tell us that he is looking for fruit. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. What kind of fruit is he looking for? The fruit he is looking for is love, which manifests itself organically for all those who tap in to the vine of Christ. We know this because of verse 8, which tells us that the fruit that we bear will prove that we are Christ's disciples. This language is identical to the new commandments that Jesus gave at the end of John 13. And this is why I have your pew Bibles open, because you can see I'm not making this stuff up. If you go back to John 13, you will see this is what he says. Love one another just as I have loved you. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. John 13, verses 34 through 35. This truth is made explicit in our chapter in 15, in verse 9, where he says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Not only, well, and before I even go on there, does that, you know, we are the outpost of heaven. So when people come to Holy Trinity, do they experience the love of Christ? Do they sense, I am loved here. These people are different. They don't sound like the news reporter I listen to they actually sound unusually different, and they're happy. They're glad to see me, even though I don't even agree with the stuff that they agree. Uh, You know, this is so unusual. Does that characterize us as Christians? I tell you the truth. When we start following Jesus, we're going to stand out from the world, and we're going to find people gravitating towards us that we never imagined. And yet at the same time, those we thought would gravitate towards us, they'll be upset. Because they'll find out that we actually believe in Jesus. And who they thought was Jesus was actually just a caricature. That's what we see. Not only is the Father looking for this fruit, but he will prune us in order to produce it. In this act of removal, God takes away everything that hinders our fruit production. He comes in and he strips away bad habits. He rearranges or reorders our priorities. And he changes our values. He may even remove friends that threaten to pull us away from Christ and into a life of sin. The order of all this is crucial. We first must draw near to Christ before any pruning work can be done. The reversal of this order will only lead to hypocrisy. Now follow me here because this is crucial. 
if we don't draw near to Christ first and we start lopping off things that we view as bad, we run the risk of looking at ourselves and thinking, you know, we're actually not that bad. You know, I'm, t- I'm, I'm going away from this. I'm avoiding this in my life. You know, I'm a pretty good guy. But, you know, when we start doing that and we start thinking, I'm actually quite, I'm not that bad. I'm a nice chap. We'll look at other people who are not chopping those things out of our life. And do we think, oh, it's okay. You don't worry about it. Is that what we think? No, we think, man, I'm glad I'm not like them. And we become self-righteous, don't we? That's what happens. It's hypocrisy. And it's not organic fruit. It's artificial because we're doing the pruning. And we're not drawing close to Jesus. And we're looking down on others. We've just become self-righteous. Even more concerning, since we did not fill ourselves first by drawing near to Christ, we will discover that there is actually a vacuum within us. And since we are not filled with Christ, we will be filled with anything and everything else. Is this not what Jesus talked about in Matthew 12 with the man with the unclean spirit? Remember, he was filled with one unclean spirit, and so he got that spirit out of his house. That is, you know, got rid of it out of his life. But do you know what that demon did? He came back with seven friends. And Jesus says it left him worse off than he was before. So do you see this? And this is, is this not the Pharisees? Whitewashed tombs. They look down at everybody, you know. They're not, these people are not chopping off the same things like I am. And then, you know, they get rid of one demon only to be filled with seven more. What should happen is that we should first draw near to Christ and allow him to do the pruning. Which, how do we know what to cut out? How do we, you know, how do we know even what's to lop off? How do we allow Christ to do this? Does anyone know the answer, by the way? God's word. We've got to go to God's word and God's ultimate word, Jesus. When we turn into, and submit to his pruning shears, he will not only cut off the harmful things in our lives, but we will start maturing without even realizing it. You know, it's similar to boys and girls. You know, when boys and girls are literal... Girls like to play with dolls. Boys like to play with, you know, trucks or action figures. But as they grow, their tastes change, don't they? And they discover reading. They discover sports. They discover the opposite sex, right? And what happens to the, the trucks and the action figures and the dolls? Well, they don't go to them anymore. You see that? Very naturally and organically, their tastes become refined. And so what does that look like for the Christian? Well, it means that we find that there is only one thing that will satisfy, and that is Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry, the collect is too good for me not to refer to. Again, this is, uh, well, not again. This is not in the sermon, but I, I was praying it several times before. Look at, look at your bulletins here, and you may want to take this home, because when I read it, I don't think you're going to believe it. But this is where I, I, my prayer throughout is I'm, I'm asking the Lord to, to move in your hearts and to move in my heart that we would actually begin to believe this. Look at this. It says, Oh God, you are prepared for those who love you such good things as su- surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. You know, I, I'm likely to lapse into Lewis. But the thing that comes to my mind is that passage where it talks about the child, may, you know, he's satisfied making mud pies in a slum when he doesn't recognize uh, an offer of a holiday at the sea. Y'all, I'm from Iowa. We had no sea but a sea of, you know, cornfields and soybeans. And the first moment that I stepped foot on Panama City Beach when I was 18 years old, I jumped into that water. And there was like, I don't know, it was like after a hurricane or something. People thought we were nuts, red flag and everything. Like, these guys are stupid. But y'all don't understand. i never been to the ocean before. And I saw it, and I was like, this is magnificent. Of course, now I've lived here for so long, I realized that was actually a deadly thing to do. But when you get exposed to the sea for the first time, it's crazy. What I would put to you, and what C.S. Lewis says, is we flit about with sex and drink and ambition, and we think these things will bring us satisfaction. And he says it's like the child flitting around with a mud pie in a slum when he doesn't recognize the offer of a holiday at the sea. And that's what the colic tells me. And you know what? It's not just you. It's me as your preacher. Do I believe this? Because guess what? 
I'm just like you. I need Jesus desperately. And so that's what is before us this day. So we now know that Christ is the true vine. And we know that the vine dresser is God the Father, and he's looking for fruit. That leads us to the question, what are the branches? Well, we, of course, are the branches. And Jesus wants to impress upon his disciples that only the branches that abide in him will find life. And they'll find it abundantly. And they won't come under God's judgment. Israel had proven incapable of bearing good fruit and was faced with God's judgment as a result. This will become true of anyone who does not seek to connect to God through Christ or who seeks to find blessing apart from him. In a nutshell, the Bible teaches us that we, if we have Christ, we shall have life. But if we don't have life, we will shrivel up and die. I'm just going to go way off uh, sermon today, and perhaps that's best. Perhaps it's the Holy Spirit. But I've been reading this trilogy. Uh, that's why I've been referencing things like the hiding place, uh, the cross, and the switchblade. And this morning, I just got caught up in God's Smuggler, the story of Brother Andrew. And the time period of uh, the uh, God's smuggler and the hiding place are Nazi Germany. And the more I read into that time and the deprivation that they went through, you know, they didn't have any food, right? Uh, and uh, just Nazis coming in uh, and just bringing the horror that they did. And, you know, I, I, I'm looking at my life, right? And I'm, you know, sitting there 6 o'clock in the morning enjoying my, you know, my freshly ground coffee from Costco. You know, sitting in my air-conditioned house because, you know, I can't have it dip below 77. That would be, just be terrible, right? And I'm sitting here reading this, and I'm like, what a spoiled brat. What a spoiled brat. But I feel like it's the Holy Spirit coming in and rousing me from the stupor of this life. Do you know what is wrong with the world? It's us. We are the problem with this world. And we are like the spoiled little teenager who has everything given to them, and we just get upset, you know, that our parents gave us, you know, a Porsche, and it doesn't have leather seats, right? I don't even know if that's possible. I don't know. I don't have a Porsche. <laughs> but you follow, the, you follow what I'm saying here. I think this is, you know, I look at Nazi Germany, and I think Satan can attack us a couple of ways. One, he can come at us with just raw evil, like he did with the Nazis. But you know an even more insidious way that he can come after us? with everything that we want, with everything that we want, because then when we will be oblivious and we will get upset when there's not everything going our way, and we will be oblivious to the, the offer of a holiday at sea. Do you see that today? Do you see that? I can't convince you. I know from Wilkerson that my words will not be enough. It's only when God the Holy Spirit becomes present in you that we can be roused from the stupor of this life. But I think it's happening I think it's happening in this little outpost of heaven. I think people are being roused from the stupor of this life. So this is where we're at. If you, have, if you have Christ, you'll have life. If you don't have him, you'll shrivel up and you'll die. And this is what we see in our culture, isn't it? Though we live in a society that has everything, yet people are miserable. How is that possible? How can people have seemingly everything that the world has to offer and yet be just filled with anxiety and anger and frustration and just, uh, just miserable? Again, our passage gives us the answer. If you have Christ, you will have life. And if you don't have him, you will shrivel up and wither away. I've seen this several th times throughout my ministry. I've had people come in, uh, you know, for counseling. You know, I used to live in Beaufort, South Carolina. If anyone's been to Beaufort, uh, it's voted the best small town in the country. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. It's like a sh Shangri-La. And then I would have people come in, you know, off the golf course, and they'd just be miserable, you know. And, you know, they'd have everything that they want. They had career success. They had, you know, like, a beautiful mansion. They lived on a plantation. They had, you know, a, a healthy family. Everything was going great. And they were miserable. And yet, at the same time, I went into Beaufort Memorial Hospital, and I visited people on their deathbed. And it was like life was pulsating from that room. Honest to goodness, I remember preaching once, and there were a couple of nurses that had come to our church because they were in that, per, in that room where the person was on their deathbed, and they could not stop talking about Jesus in their church. And the nurses are like, well, i got to go check this thing out. But what gives? In one sense, a person has everything, and they're withering. 
And yet, in another sense, a person has nothing. And they're on death's door. And yet, they're pulsating with life. What's the difference? One has Jesus. And the other does not. One is tapping into an empty cistern. They're looking for blessing from an empty well. And the other has tapped into the power and the living water of Jesus Christ. But all this leads us to an urgent question. How can we tap into Christ? How can we abide in him? Two points. First, the vine and the branches imagery is just another proof that there is no such thing as solitary Christianity. You can't go it alone. If we want to bear fruit and flourish, then we need to stay connected to the vine. And do you know what that is? It's God's people, part of it. And so if we think that we're going to thrive and flourish uh, and be satisfied, and yet we're not coming to the outpost of heaven, if we're not fellowshipping with other believers, how can we expect to flourish? That's, that's the first point. The second, we can only draw near to God and be transformed into Christ's image through God's word. And this is what Jesus has been impressing upon his disciples. Look back at John 14, verse 23. Again, this is why the Pew Bibles are helpful. John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Unless we see that Christ's word must cleanse us, our ideas of purity and what will bring about positive change will only be man-made, and they will not work. What is more, they will not yield good fruit. David asked the question in Psalm 119, verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? And then he answers, by living according to your word. Similarly, Jesus says to his disciples in verse 3 of our chapter, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Again, nothing will keep us away from sin and bring about the positive change in our lives that we desire, but careful attention to an application of God's word, an ultimate word, Jesus Christ. The night that David Wilkerson stopped relying on himself and he began to pray for those several minutes, Sitting in the crowd was a violent young gang leader named Nikki Cruz. Nikki had previously slapped David in the face and threatened to kill him because David had the audacity to tell him that God loved him. Listen to what Nikki said happened after he observed David pray and then begin to preach again. And this is what Nikki writes. The preacher said the Holy Spirit could get inside people and make them clean. He said it didn't matter what they'd done. The Holy Spirit could make them new like babies. Suddenly, I wanted that so bad I couldn't stand it. It was as if I was seeing myself for the first time. All the filth and the hate and the foulness like pictures in front of my eyes. You can be different, he said. Your life can be changed. I wanted that. I needed that. And so I prayed, dear God, I'm the dirtiest sinner in New York. I don't think you want me. If you do want me, you can have me. As bad as I was before, I want to be that good for Jesus. As a result, Nikki went on to become a pastor, evangelist, and Christian author. In his latest book from 2013, I like the title. It says, the, or its title is, The Devil Has No Mother. <laughs> And it's a, it's, the, uh, it's a book about uh, the devil's hunger for power. And yet, Jesus' ability to still win the day. How is that possible? If we find it hard to love God and to love others, we need simply to stop looking at ourselves. And we need to look to Jesus Christ and said, we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus. For the prophet Isaiah foretold that Christ would be cut off from the land of the living. He would be like those branches that were torn from the vine and burned in the judgment. Don't you see that happened to Jesus on the cross so that you and I, who are like Nikki, dirty sinners, could be grafted into the vine of Christ. On the cross, Jesus became hated so that we could be loved. On the cross, Jesus, the true Israel, received the judgment that we deserved for our stinking grapes in order that we might receive the spoils of his victory and might start bearing good fruit. 
before I close, I do want to say this, because if any of you struggle to love others, maybe there's something in your life right now, I think what you need to do is you need to stop looking at yourself because you're never going to get over the bitterness. That's the issue, right? They deserve your bitterness. But then you have to ask the question, did, uh, did your sin, did it deserve Jesus' bitterness? And the answer is yes. Your sin was so bad that it necessitated the death of God. And do you know what Jesus did? He willingly gave up his life so that you and I could be saved. And so when we have bitterness towards somebody, and again, this is where you have to say, God, I can't do this. You must. We must turn it over to him. And we must look to Jesus and see him receiving the judgment that we deserved. And when we see that judgment fall upon Jesus, how can we show any judgment to those who have sinned against us? Do you see this truth? I tell you the truth. When I and all of us start believing this, we will stand out from the world. This truth is powerful. And once we tap into it, tap into the vine of Christ, we will cry out with the hymn writer, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to thy fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Are we abiding in the vine of Christ today? I'm going to do as uh, I observe David do. Would you bow and pray with me? Lord, I'm going to stand out of the way. You must move, and not just in the congregation's life. You know in my own life that I need to stop seeking blessing in places other than you. And I pray, Lord, that this would become a reality, not just in my life, but in everyone that's here. Lord, may I recede that you send your Holy Spirit to do the work that only you can do, and may we abide in you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.